A Burning is her first book. We could not be more proud. There's so much to talk about. This book, I, I am so happy for our first edition uh, members because they have signed first editions. They should hang on to them because they are precious, precious, precious items. Um, because this, this book is going to be uh, in so many English curriculums, uh, high school and college all over because it allows so much discussion, so much intellectual um, discovery, interrogation. It's just, it's so rich, but let's just launch in because there's so much to talk about. Thank you so much, Julie, for that very generous and kind introduction. Thank you for picking my book. Um, and thank you for, for having me today. I'm so excited to chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I have so many questions. Um, for, oh, and also I should explain first, like people are like, oh, what's the first edition? So Book Passage uh, has a club. It's called the First Editions Club. It's been going on since 2003. And it focuses, I mean, a lot of places have different versions of these clubs, but our club is, I think, I'm biased, is special because we do signed first edition books focused on debut and unknown writers. And this is really important to us because we believe at Book Passage, the power of, of fiction, of, of stories. And we believe that the debut and unknown authors are the ones that have the messages, the urgent messages that need to be, be put out there. They're fresh, they're not formulaic. No, they're not sticking to something that was done before. They are fresh new ideas that the inquiring mind is hungry for. So that's why I love this club. We look at all the debuts that are coming out every month and we, uh, we have the privilege of selecting one and allowing and, and, and allowing it to, to live on this platform um, where we promote it, we send its message. We have over, I think, 300 members around the world. And so I just love it when uh, people want to sign up and want more because it's telling, it's telling us like, we're hungry. We want more. We want more. We want to expand our minds. And so they're entrusting us to, give them something that's like nourishment, which this is like multi-packed power vitamin. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. amazing. That's amazing that you have so many members. Um, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, I love it. Um, okay, so, okay, let, let's, let's launch in. There's so, this book asks so many big life questions, forceful questions with real, uh, with real intellectual heft. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, Political, there's a lot of real world political stakes. Um, but at the same time, it has this gripping hold of a thriller, right? So it's like intellectual heft and critically acclaimed literary masterpiece, like sandwich. And for someone that's been doing this for a while, I don't usually see that combo. So I almost, I almost missed my flight because I was at the airport. This is like pre-COVID. It's probably one of my last flights. I was reading the arc going through, going through, reading, reading. I almost missed my flight. Like my, my, my kid oh my had to like grab me because I was so engaged because I had this like, what's going to happen next quality to it. So how did you do that? Oh my God. Well, that means so much to me, Julie. I know that you must read just hundreds of books a year and you must, you know, think about all of them so carefully and, and to have this generous read from you means a lot. I mean, you know, I, I was thinking about a craft challenge that I set myself when I was working on this book. And that was, can I write a book which has intellectual seriousness, like you said, you know, a book which asks questions about the rise of the right wing, about living in a time of hatred filled ideologies about trying to pursue ambitions and dreams during such circumstances and within a society where, you know, the structures and systems don't always serve you. So those were kind of the serious questions that I had in mind, but I was also thinking, can I write a story which puts those questions forward 
but also has an aspect which is entertaining and fun. Can I bring those questions together with a side of storytelling where somebody can come home after work and instead of watching Netflix, can read my book. What would that form of storytelling look like? So I was very attentive to things like pace. I was thinking about, you know, what does each chapter do? What does each scene do? Um, I really learned a lot from TV. I was thinking about the, you know, very tightly structured TV shows that we all like to binge watch. And at the time, I don't know, it was probably shows like Mad Men or, you know, whatever we all were watching. Um, but thinking about TV was very helpful for structure um, with the caveat, of course, that books are a completely different medium and allow you to be so much closer to a character's consciousness. Yeah, for sure. Well, you're going to have to teach that craft because I feel like the next generation is used to this pattern of binge watching. Like I, I would tell my kids, I'm like, you're not supposed to watch this show. It's designed that you're supposed to wait a week and then watch it again because you're, you're creating this like alter reality. It's not supposed to be ingested like so quickly. So, um, but that's, you know, they don't want to hear like how it was in the olden days. So, but, you're, but that's, it, that's, I, I just thought it was brilliant that you were able to combine those two because the messages that you have in your book are really important. And one of them was, you know, I, I couldn't stop talk, thinking about Javon and Lovely and PT, sir, um, like throughout my trip, because I was on a trip and then also viewing the news and reading other characters and reading other books and other dilemmas that debut authors are putting out. Like, like they were very, it didn't matter that you were, it, being in a book in India, of course, that's the scene and, and you know, a, a, it's a train wreck that happens in India. It's really selling, it's not, it's not what it's about. That is not what the book is about. That's like the easy kind of like nugget to throw out there, but that's not what it's about. Um, at least I, that's from my perspective. I just feel like a lot of the things- Yeah, I agree. That, that these characters going through, like it's happening in real life and it's happening with other characters that authors are putting out in the world because I feel like it's a real human thing, which is where your your anthro your social anthropologic anthropology studies, I think that really informs it. I don't know if it was purposeful, but it it really uh, I see some I see some threat. It's not by accident. Let's just say. I appreciate that so much, you know, because I think that, um, so I studied anthropology in undergrad and then in grad school. And I think that anthropology gives any fiction writer, and you've done some anthropology too. We were just talking about this before, but that kind of close observation um, and the way in which anthropology teaches you to look beyond simple explanations, you know? Anthropologists are always looking for complexity. They're always looking for surprise. They're always wondering, you know, what are people saying? How are they behaving? What are the gaps in those two? How do people um, think of their place in the world? So trying to occupy another person's perspective is very much part of what current anthropology is about. And I feel like it offers such a wonderful toolkit for anybody who's writing fiction, which of course requires that kind of, you know, perspective shift and that kind of um, close observation of the people around you. Mm -hmm. um, Julie, I know that, um, so one thing that I really want to ask you is that you have been running this first editions club for a while. You read a huge volume of new books all the time. I would love to have a peek at, you know, what are you thinking about when you read a new book. What are the things that you're looking for? What are the things that excite you? Wow. Um, it's never, uh, you know, well, I have a lot of help. So Louisa, who's our head buyer, um, and Karen West, who runs events, and Elaine Petricelli, who's the owner of Book Passage, um, 
we all put our heads together or, you know, all of us are reading arcs all the time, like stacks and stacks of arcs. But I really, when I read, I have that first edition member in mind who they're, they're entrusting every month. Like they just, we just, we don't even ask them. We just charge the card and send out the book. And they're entrusting us to give them something that's really, um, you know, it's got to be great writing. It, 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 you know, it, it's, um, it's usually, it always is about something urgent of our time. It's, it, it's, it, it's in examining something. It's asking you to think. It's not a joyride book. It's not a show book. It's a, it's a, you know, be in this spot and see what it's like type of book. So you can, it's, it's like a cost-effective way to understand humanity. I think the first edition club is the cost-effective way to understand humanity. So everyone sign up. No, but- it's an but amazing pitch. Yes. <laughs> no, but seriously, it's about, we feel a great responsibility that since you're entrusting us to just charge your card, that we give you something that's really nourishing. Um, your book is perfect. It's it's, 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 it's got the bonus piece because we normally don't, they're always engaging, but not at this, not at this level. I mean, it's like yours is like a roller coaster and then a lot of Ted talk at the same time, <laughs> like a roller coaster Ted talk. Um, Love it. But yeah, so we're looking, you know, uh, we also like to, we're very, we're very careful at looking what we've picked before and what we have, because we look at it as a collection. So we know that the reader has a body of, of things. We want to make sure different voices are heard from all, you know, all lenses, all perspectives um, that help you round out the human that you are. So that's how we kind of do it. There's no formula, but we just know I feel yeah. like a lot of times we know when we know. And so we'll be, as soon as we know, like there's a lot of texting going on, like pick this one up or, you know, what are you reading? Like, why is that, why is that on top of your stack? Or, you know, so it's very, it's very organic, but it, I feel that we always get to a good place. I love it. So I, can I ask you one more question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so I know that, you know, the event is for, um, a burning and I am so grateful for your very, very generous read of it and for, for lifting it up over this past year. But I'm so curious to hear what are a couple other recent favorites that you've picked? I mean, I would love to hear what you've really loved. Oh, one I really loved was um, Things We Lost to the Water. Me too. Yeah. yeah so good. Yeah. So good. So good. I love Eric. I yeah. love him. I love how, um, what I really loved is, is that his book is helping to take, you know, like, I feel like that, that immigrant, that refugee story is such a single track story. And I love that the second generation gets a voice and what's it like, like they're allowed to be more than one thing, you know, and so how to break away from that. And there's one, I, um, I just, we just picked it. It's this month. It's going out. I've already announced it, so I think it's okay. But Monica West revival season. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, it's so good because she is from Oakland. Um, she's African American writer, and I love the fact that her book doesn't really have to do with that. It has to do with the patriarchy, and that's a whole nother talk. You can listen to that conversation. I think it's happening in September. Amazing. But I love that we can. She can, we, she can write a book. I mean, she's a human above and beyond anything. And this, this um, you know, misogyny or the patriarchy is a universal thing. And so I loved that. Uh, it's also um, told from, the, from a 15 year old's perspective, oh, um, which has a lot of scout vibes for me um, from To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. Um, so those are my, I love them all. I mean, Maggie Shipstead, Great Circle, like epic. I just um, got that book. I need to read it. I'm so excited. It's, it's, a, it's another, I mean, they're all so good. I'm trying to think. I'm just the most recent ones. Those are the most recent ones. But I feel like I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I, there's, I mean, I love them all. I love them. Yeah. All. Yeah. No, like, totally. I actually... 
Um, I have, it's so funny that you mentioned Eric's book because I have it right here. I'll show it for anybody who's watching on YouTube in case you um, want to see the cover. This is the book that Julia and I both just exclaimed about the yes. novels that we've both loved. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I had a guy, I was getting coffee. I have a normal route to get coffee with my dog. And this guy was driving by and he rolled out his window. He said, are you the one that does the first edition club? The book <laughs> passage? I was like, yeah, that's so random. And he said, I love this month's book. It was so good. I'm like, oh, that's great. It was just, I mean, I'm great. It just makes me so happy because it's showing that, you know, they're, they're like, the, people are hungry for perspective to hear other right. people's stories. It's great. It's yeah. great. Okay. So I have questions. Um, belonging. I, you, through your characters, through your three characters, you are able to really uh, present in, on, on, on display the primal need to belong. It's a human need. It's like everything else, right? Like food, water, air. Um, you need to belong. And I feel like that, you know, against uh, systems or this oppression or the system that doesn't allow you to do that, there's that tension and then the collateral damage that happens when those systems are so crushing. Um, so, I, I mean, how, where in your life have you witnessed this, this, you know, you obviously have a great set, you have a great understanding for this primal need. And so, what life experiences informed you of this? Like, where have you witnessed it, and or have you struggled it for with it, or like, can you elaborate a yeah. little? Bit? That's a great question, you know. And I don't think I mean you're making me think about it in the frame of belonging, which is so interesting to me because you know so much of the story was born out of things I witnessed and thought about growing up in India. Um, so, you know, one of the characters, Lovely, um, she is marginalized in really complex ways. And she is somebody who um, is told that she has a certain place in society and, you know, her dreams have to be very limited. And she kind of defies that, you know, she has this wild dream of being a movie star and she goes to these acting classes and so belonging in her life is something that she has to fight for um and she's also somebody who an aspect of her which was present from very very early drafts for me um is that she's somebody who is not interested in book learning you know she's not interested in books and she kind of you know, disdains them and she makes fun of them. And I think that came to me from when I was a kid and I would go to school on the school bus and out the window of the school bus, I would see other kids my age who were washing dishes in the gutter by the roadside because they worked at those little roadside restaurants or, you know, we would have to, um, in those days, we, we didn't buy so many like ready-made clothes. We would go to a shop to buy fabric and then go to a tailor and have it made. Um, and so when you went to the tailor, the tailor's apprentice would be a kid around my age. And so I realized very early that there are people for whom, you know, books are not a big part of their lives, you know, going to school and studying for exams, all of the things that were so basic and central for me were not so for them. And I realized the, the profound injustice of simply being born into a class of society where you don't have these opportunities, where school is not something you can take for granted. And so, you know, those thoughts, I think, bled into the book, which is so concerned with, you know, moving up in society. What does that look like? Who has the opportunity to get ahead? Who has the opportunity to have big ambitions? And who finds themselves constantly thwarted? You know, um, 
Class mobility was very interesting to me in the in the central character of of Jeevan, who is a young woman. You know, she has a job at a mall. Um, she has a new phone. She just wants to move up in society and give her parents a more comfortable life. But you know, she makes this politically risky comment on Facebook and gets into big trouble because of it. But but she's also somebody who's trying to do better. You know, who's who's saying, I refuse to be in this place. I refuse to accept systems which don't give me what I deserve. I'm going to go out and fight for a clean water supply and fight for the chance to have um, a job which has dignity, you know? Um, so thinking about all of those aspects, like even if there were things in my childhood which, which didn't directly make it into the book, I think a lot of what I absorbed from the people around me um, did make it in here. And that also, that also includes humor, you know? Um, like, I think that something that I saw that was really important to me to include in the book was how people deal with problems with humor. You know, in a place like Kolkata, where I grew up, there are so many problems. You know, in the rainy season, the streets flood and there's no way to go out without like wading in this murky water. Or, you know, you have to pay your electricity bill and you have to go to this office, which is far away and you have to stand in line for several hours. So like life is filled with daily problems, but people deal with it with such spirit and humor. And that's something I wanted in the book as well. I love that aspect of the book. I, I, you know, because it's kind of, that's what humans do. Like when it really, like the, the heart of it, it is funny. Like you, you can choose, it's, your, it's a choice. It's always a choice. Like yeah. you, can, you can say this is miserable and unfair. And you know, a lot of times it is, or you, but there's always a choice to see some levity. And I think your book really, point that out. I lived in China in the 80s um, in Beijing and it's the same thing. It was like you go from, you know, and you probably, well, I was going to say you probably experienced like the juxtaposition of being growing up in, in India and then coming to Boston. I mean, that was probably very jarring and, um, you know, like, like very rich in observation to ob observe. Um, but yeah, in, you know, like you can, you can either like complain about it because it's so different and it's so like not efficient and all these other things, or you can just find the humor and the camaraderie and the fun. And we're all laughing, you know, we can all choose to laugh. We all can choose to be in this negative swirl and it's a choice. Yeah. I love hearing that you lived in Beijing. I spent just a little bit of time, like less than a year in Beijing, uh, were you living there for a long time? I lived there as a student uh, at the university at Beida for a year. And it was right before Tiananmen Square. So during that time, the, the students, there's a lot of tension. And there's a lot, like all the Fordham students, we were heavily, heavily um, watched. Like you, oh my God. So there's a lot of, uh, you could feel the unrest at the time. I couldn't articulate what it was, but... Uh, because I, you know, I think I was, I don't know how old I was back then, 20, 21, but um, I didn't have a lot of life experience to understand like what is going on. So, mm -hmm. you know, you see back then they made copies on a ditto machine. And so you, I don't know if you know what, what that is. What is a ditto machine? Ditto machine is like before they had Xerox copiers. Oh my God. I do not know this. So you put <laughs> this thing, you, I don't know, you, you transfer on this, like not carbon, but it's like, I don't know how to explain it. A carbon copy? It wasn't a carbon copy. It was like oh. something between a carbon copy and a Xerox machine. You put okay. it on a drum and then you like, you, you like turn the drum and all the, like that's how every, every rotation made a copy. Oh, wow. So I'm kind of dating myself, but anyway. Oh, that's fascinating. That's how they got the flyers to go around and stuff. But that's, oh a, whole my other, God. that's a whole other Have story. you ever... You should write about it. This sounds fascinating. Uh, what yeah, a well, time. I think somebody Good else thing. might. Write. <laughs> um, maybe Zach will write about it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but back to your characters, I really really appreciated the the richness of your character and their their inner life. I think that's what grabbed me is because so quickly I was vested. 
I was invested to see what happened, you know, to Javon. And there's one line I just remember when she, her hair, her hair's wet, right? Her hair's wet when she's in that opening chapter. Um, and she's going through her phone and uh, she posts something. And then there's this one, I, I wrote it down because I remember I was reading it. And it says, um, when she was ra- when she was watching the, the likes rack up for the train mm-hmm. attack. And then she says, right after that, quote, nobody liked my reply. And a quote, and I was thinking, oh my God, I, I feel that. That's the ultimate feeling that you're not accepted. And so very quickly, we're able to, to get into the, the soul. Like we're, we're able to like, you know, get down in there. And it, I just think that's, that is another masterful, I don't know how you did it, but even lovely, like when my daughter was reading it, she was saying early on, this is like when she first got to know lovely, She's like, do you think Lovely would wear this? I think Lovely would like this. I think she would she would rock that that pink shade of, you know, <laughs> she'd be bold. So, um, so very quickly you started, like, how did you get inspired? Like, how where did these come from? And because they, they all three have circumstances and choices they have to make. Yeah. Um, but why these three? Yeah. Well, thank you for for reading them with with such care and and bringing everything that you brought to them. I feel like one of the things that has been a joy this past year having the book out is just seeing how, you know, the book feels like half a book until somebody reads it and brings their their wisdom and their reflections to it. So um, that means a lot to me. I think the characters, you know, the characters were ways for me to break down the big question that I had. You know, this book started with me reading the news from far away and watching what was happening in India, feeling really alarmed, feeling really worried. Um, And I wanted to ask, you know, in the middle of these circumstances, how do you hold on to big dreams? How do you hold on to your spirit and your humor and your ambitions um, while the society around you makes this turn toward right-wing nationalism? What does that look like? And that question felt so big, I had to break it down. And my way of breaking it down was through these three characters. So, you know, with Jeevan, who is the central character, young woman, makes a comment on Facebook and gets into trouble. Um, I was thinking, you know, what happens when it's your narrative versus the narrative imposed on you by the state? What recourse do you have for telling your own story and trying to move ahead and trying to gain freedom in that way? Um, And then for P.T. Sir, who's the second character, who's a um, gym teacher, who, you know, he he gets a little glimpse of political power because he grows close to this right-wing political party. Um, and he has to figure out what of his morals he will hold on to and what he will sacrifice in order to gain more political power in this society. And I was thinking, you know, if a person in this vastly unequal society has a shot at political power, has a shot at moving up, what will they sacrifice? You know, what will they decide their moral center is? And then the third and final main character, um, Lovely, I just wanted to write this kind of joyous arc for a character who is not naive at all. You know, she is so intimately familiar with the oppressions of the state. She's so familiar with what it means to be humiliated, to be laughed at, to be looked down upon. And yet, despite all of these structural challenges, she's somebody who has this big dream of being a movie star. And what is that storyline like? So those were kind of the three questions. And I felt like these are the three characters who can help me 
ask that question because I often think of, I mean, I think definitely with a burning, I was thinking about the book as a way to ask a question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. And that get, that was um, Eric Nguyen, Nguyen's, um, the, his, he, he made the comment um, when we spoke to him is um, every uh, art is an attempt to answer a question. And, um, and that was like my, one of my questions that you've already answered is what is the big question that you are trying to answer with your artist statement, with your novel? And so, so yeah, it's, um, I'm glad that we got, we get answers to three, we get, <laughs> uh, three answers for one book. Uh, but that's why it's so packed. It's so, there's so much to talk about in which I am not kidding. It, it will be on required reading lists for sure, because it really, really skillfully allows you to wear the shoes of another, which I think is a skill we all need to, as as a species, we need to do more. Of, we need to flex that a lot more. And I think your book allows us to get to that next, moves us fo- forward into that evolution, into that state, which which is why you were so easily, that's what we want first edition books to do. Mm, I Um, appreciate that so much, Julie. Can I ask you another question, which this (laughs) brings up for me? Um, Which is, what are the questions that you feel have most excited you in your journey as a reader? I mean, you were talking about how you led a book club for a long time before Mm -hmm. you started working at Book Passage. And now, of course, you know, I imagine your life is just full of books of all kinds. What are the questions that that excite you? I think I think anything that deals with um, like raising consciousness. I think anything that deals with uh, inviting the reader or myself when I'm reading to look at my to, to question. To, to lead more of an examined life mm. and to question the status quo and to kind of not judge it, but at least take time to observe it, to, to interrogate it, to investigate it. Like, wh- how did we get here? Because I feel a lot of things like when we go on autopilot, it's not necessarily great. And even if we do keep it, at least we examined it. So I think any book that, you know, like, like, the fa- like one is like the family structure. Why does it, why is it like, why is it the formula, man, woman, uh, two and a half kids, two car garage, a dog, a cat, you know, like, why is it all like that? Because that's the story and everything's built around it. Our cars, our houses, our, our legal system. And like, so like why, so just, just books that make the reader say, how, what, how, what we just accept that blindly Mm -hmm. but why so I think anything that makes you pause and and examine uh it 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 gets it gets to the to the to the top of the stack and also gets some texting back and forth to the group (laughs) so yeah that's a great way to think about it. A book that helps you live a more examined life. I love that. Yeah, I think um, I'm glad. I'm glad this is recorded because I'm gonna have to go back and coin that someplace. But um, but no, that's why I love it, and that's why I love these conversations. I love talking all the booksellers who are always talking about like you know like the book, how it made you think, and it's just such a rich. That's why working at the bookstore is is so enriching it's just really it's it it's not a job it's almost like a I don't know it's a it's a human fulfillment in a in a different way um okay freedom that's another topic I had because each character has a deep thirst for freedom um it's so visceral um the freedom to poet post on Facebook the freedom to use your voice the freedom, you know, uh, for PT Sir to pull out a dagger on the roof of a car, um, the freedom to get out of poverty, to not be poor—all these things about 
freedom. And this one quote that Javon, um, you know, she admired these strangers. This is the beginning of the book. She admired these strangers that, on Facebook who could say anything they wanted to. And that was such a privilege and something she was saying, I think, oh, after a couple enough uh, paychecks that maybe she'll get that too. And just, wow. Right. Like that just makes, as a reader, you just stop like, wow. You know, that to a lot of people, they don't have that privilege and um so yeah yeah, so we're like you obviously felt a need to because each of them have very clear clear thirst Mm -hmm. for freedom yeah I appreciate that question um you're right that each character in this book is chasing their own form of freedom. I think the thing that maybe links all of them is this perception that, you know, freedom is the ability to chase a better life, you know, and they all find themselves facing different barriers. So for instance, Jivan, the central character, um, the the line that you that you quoted is her looking at all of these um, middle class or perhaps wealthy people on Facebook who are able to make jokes and who are able to criticize authorities and criticize people in power. And they know that they will not be punished for those jokes. You know, that is their freedom that they can express themselves. It's this kind of um, ascendance that comes with becoming middle class is you feel protected somehow, you know, and she feels that she doesn't yet have that. She's vulnerable in certain ways. She's still figuring out the big space of social media. And in this, you know, I was thinking about the many, many people in India who are accessing the internet and social media for the first time. I think, um, India is the country which has the most number of Facebook users in the world. Um, And, you know, there's a huge population who are using cell phones and accessible and affordable data plans and coming online for the first time. You know, it's a new social terrain. It's a new space in which to exercise freedom and in which to find barriers to freedom. So that's kind of, you know, where where Jeevan was. Um, And for the others, you know, I think there's something so poignant and so moving in the reality of being denied basic freedoms, you know, like having to fight for clean water, having to fight for a place to stay that will not be demolished. Um, When you go to the doctor, being believed when you tell them about your pain and your injury, um, and of course, that's in Jeevan's life. And for somebody like P.T. Sir, who's the school teacher, who's already this, you know, middle class person, has an OK life, but he's not happy with it. For him, it's, you know, how to be closer to the center of power in the society, because as a school teacher, he's constantly, you know, ignored by his students. They don't take him seriously. They make fun of him. And so there's some part of him that feels rejected and he wants to rise above that. He wants to be closer to a politician who can make things happen, who can, you know, make sure that the lane in front of his school doesn't flood when it rains. Um, so each of these characters is thinking about freedom quite, quite differently based on their class status and what they've already had in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could, I mean, P.T. Sir is an interesting character to me. And I, I see that you wrote him in the third person. I'm always interested. I, I, another thing that I really appreciate about the first edition authors is they always give some space to the reader to decide for themselves. You know, they get you really close to the character, but they they hold back on judgment. They present honestly, but they hold back on the commentary, which I feel that you did. And I, I thought it was very interesting, strategic that you wrote him in the third person. 
Um, but his dilemma is really real. Like to want to be seen, to be seen and to be important to somebody, to be, to be relevant. And we've all been there. I mean, if we have enough years on us, we certainly have all been there. It's a real feeling. Um, and so my question, I have, I had a, a separate question for him is, um, do you believe, well, is it, is a, that is a person bad because of their acts or does a good person make bad choices? That's a great question. You know, I never wanted to write a character who is a villain or, you know, is, is a bad person. I was more interested in looking at how systems force individuals to occupy positions in which their choices are so limited in which they might feel that, you know, either I have a chance to get ahead and chase my ambition or somebody else does, you know, they don't feel that they can rise together as a community within this society. It's, you know, each person for themselves. And so PT Sir finds himself in a position where he can either seek justice for Jeevan and help support her in her court case, or he can sacrifice those morals and grow closer to the political party that is inviting him in, that is promising him a life of greater comfort and greater power and greater access. And I think, you know, to some degree, we all make those choices. I mean, something that I think about, you know, when I go to the grocery store and buy, you know, fruit or shrimp is how those products were farmed and delivered to me and all the people who worked there and how I am choosing to consume a product which, you know, is coming to me on the backs of people who are probably very underpaid, work very hard, are trying to save money to say, you know, to send back to their families. And that's the kind of daily injustice which is in front of me. And yet I make the choice to consume that product, you know? So what does that make me, mm -hmm. you know? So I think about those choices a lot. Um, and, and I think that there is, there is so much examination to be done of the systems that force us into these places where, you know, we value convenience and affordability over justice. That is a, that is an ethical choice that I am making as well, you know, so I don't have the answers, but those are questions that I, that I think about a lot. Right. At least it's in your consciousness, like yeah. it's in your, it, it's in your orbit. Yeah. Um, um, I see questions that Zach put in the chat. Can you see them, Julie? Yes, I can see them. Okay. I will I will hold mine because I have one, at least one I have to get in, but I will um, get these because Christy Toronto writes, what other writers from India do you read? The culture is so diverse and rich in color, sound and very strong when standing up to oppression. And I always learn more reading about India. Oh, so many. Um, well, one writer that um, I have found very influential um, is, of course, Jhumpa Lahiri. Um, I loved her new book, which is called Whereabouts. It's a departure, I think, from her previous novels. It's very, very different, um, but it's a really beautiful book. And there are so many um, writers like um, Sanjana Satyan, who just had a novel out called Gold Diggers, which is about Indian Americans. And um, it's about immigration and ambition. And um, it has magical elements, which were really surprising and, and really, really fun to read. Um, I just read um, the Bangladeshi writer Tamima Anam's book, um, which is called The Startup Wife. It's about being a woman of color in the tech world. Um, so there are all of these incredible writers um, who are publishing 
really fun boundary pushing books, which, which I really love. I love Gold Diggers as well. I thought it was Isn't it also, so much fun? It was hilarious, <laughs> but also very thought provoking. Um, yeah, what are we chasing? Like at what cost? I mean, yeah. it just, I mean, it was it was very close. It was very close because I had a daughter applying to college at, during the time that I was reading the Ark, so it was it was interesting. Oh my but, god! Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so this other one from uh, Seal Tinley. Uh, I think it's more of a question than a, I mean, a statement than a, a question, but we'll read it. The big and personal events of the day have personal consequences and personal events can have social and political consequences. It felt so important to bring all these lenses to one narrative. Totally agree. Um, Davida Hartman. I'm enjoying this conversation, eager to read a burning, plus would like to know if Mega is working on another book now. Um, I am working on a new book, a new novel, uh, very, very slowly. I feel like the pandemic just, you know, wreaked havoc on my, on my schedules and on separations between home life and work life. Um, so I'm trying to get back on track. Um, but yeah, I'm working on, on a new novel, which I'm very excited about. I am too. I'm going to. I'm gonna have to for that arc when it, when it comes. Um, I had a question about um because the issues that you highlight in your book um are not just India's, it's can be found around the world. And it was interesting because right now people would say, Oh, this is so timely, you know, but you this is four years in the making. This is not about our political situation today. It was something you had seen in your in your social. Um, you know, view um, that maybe wasn't as wasn't as surfaced over here at the time when you were writing, but now it's very evident. There's so many parallels, and you know, if it's not misogyny, it's police brutality, uh, basic human rights, like having water or clean water. I mean, I can think about Detroit, you know, mm -hmm. and um, enforced poverty of the uh, Hydra. Is that how you pronounce it? community like the systemic like it's there's so many parallels to to our country and you could probably go to a, a lot of other places and you could and you can see the matrix right you can see the grid like this is everywhere so my question is what does it say about us as a human species as as as, as a human like is it an animal phenomenon or and what can we learn about like from bees and dolphins and trees you know, that is such a vast and important question. I, I do think about it a lot. And I think that, you know, one thing that at least the pandemic, I think, made apparent to all of us here in the US is that so many of the systems and structures that we live within do not serve us. You know, we were completely left to fend for ourselves. And what I found remarkable was the growth of things like mutual aid societies, neighbors helping neighbors, you know, um, ordinary people coming together. And it, it does make me think about, you know, what kind of other shape might society take? What forms of government might be more effective? How, how might political representation begin to look different? Um, yeah, so these are all huge questions. And I think you are so wise to think about, well, what does it look like in in the lives of animals and trees, you know, because um, I was just reading this book about um, fungi and fungal networks under under trees, and you know they have these vast social networks, and you know that form of life is still a form of life, even though it looks so different from ours, and it's still a form of communal living, even though it looks so different from ours. So I think you are very right to think about what lessons do we have there. Yeah. Have you, there's a great documentary, Fantastical Fungi. Is this on Netflix? I think I, I saw the, the little box. I haven't watched it. It's awesome. 
Yeah. It's like if yeah, if you're into that tree, the the trees, uh, you have to watch it. It's so good. I will watch it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I just like sometimes I watch the ants. Like I watch the ants. They're so clever. Everybody's working. Everyone's picking up a twig. Everybody's like, do you know? Even the big ant, the queen bee, like it all kind of works like dolphins. They all take their turn when they're swirling around a, a massive fish, you know, they, some take it and they jump out of the circle and another one comes in. It's like, can you imagine that? Like I watched at the hardware store when mass like came in off the truck and people were not like jumping in and going out. I mean, it was a different, it was a whole different behavior going on, but um, mm. yeah, I mean, I don't know. These are, these are, these are questions. It's a question. Um, okay, I'm watching the time. I still have, um, I wanted to ask, if what essay prompt would you assign to a high school college English class um, for your book? Because we know it's all going to be required reading, so. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I, I, I wouldn't presume that, that my book would be assigned to anybody, but um, I think I would probably encourage um, young people, people of that age, to think about injustice as they have seen it in their own lives um, or in their own communities, in their own cities and towns. In what form have they witnessed injustice? And what do they think might be a way forward from there? You know, not to say that they should have an easy solution because these things do not have easy solutions, but what are, what are some ways that they might be grappling with it? What are the ways in which they see some path forward from instances of injustice? And I think with that, um, one one thing that I loved about your character, Lovely, is that as funny and quirky and lovable and joyful and she's just a light, you can just sense it from, from how you've crafted her on the page, is she is, she's part of the resistance. She is such a role model. Like she goes in there with Margaret Atwood's June, you know, like she... But in a very fun, like, you know, joyful, June's kind of serious, but, um, but she's part of the resistance. And I love her take on, like, when someone throws you something, you just, you just smile, you just kill them with your kindness. And she, <laughs> she, she dissolves their, their power by her, her humor and her joy and her light. And I just think it's such a great, it's such a great role model. Thank you for, for reading her as, you know, a part of the resistance, because I absolutely agree that that form of humor can be a weapon and that form of defiant joy can be um, a way to resist all the ways in which the oppressions of this state seek to get you down and seek to, you know, put you in your place responding to that with laughter and with jokes and with teasing other people um that is absolutely a, a weapon for her yeah and i love that it's available to anybody we're born with it so it doesn't matter what your paycheck says it's available to everybody which i love so i that's true um, we don't have any more if anybody has questions you can also i as you can tell I strongly recommend you pick up this book. Summer is summer reading. I mean, it is summer reading and, and plus. I'm telling you, it's the roller coaster ride and the TED Talk combined. And um, <laughs> it's in paperback, so it's easy for you to grab. Um, just, I think it's uh, the link to get it from the store is um, on on, uh, on the YouTube um, chat or, or channel. Um, it is really um, an, a fantastic read. I, and, you know, book club, you, you're going to have to, you're going to want to give it to somebody because you're going to want to discuss it. it. It's just one of those books that make you think um, a, in a very fun and enjoyable and entertaining way. I can't say enough about it. It's a gift. Um, I'm so proud to have it on our, our first edition club uh, listing. And um, Mega, we can't wait for um, more. I'm sorry, I just realized during this whole thing, I never, we never had to do a reading, but 
hopefully. I feel like this conversation was so much fun and I'm glad we got to spend every minute chatting. Um, thank you so much, Julie. And thank you everybody watching. Please support Book Passage, an incredible bookstore. You can get my book or you can get any of the other books that we talked about today. Um, you can get their June pick for the first editions club, I think. Um, but yeah, support this bookstore and thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Mega. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye.